accurate chance. Oh. Yeah, so we introduce open rewrite and open AI, two very different technologies. Um, open rewrite, a rule-based system producing 100% accurate transformations. Open AI, um, AI system, as we know, they can hallucinate, however, they make things much faster uh, to do and the kind of the marriage between the two and where one is appropriate, where the other is appropriate, I hope um, uh, will make it um, clear, clearer to reason about at the end of this presentation. So I'm, I'm CTO and co-founder at Modern, the company behind Open Rewrite. Uh, Sam, well, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. My name's Sam, and I'm a VP of Engineering at Open Rewrite. Specifically, I'm responsible for the team that uh, <clears throat> maintains and uh, develops on our core refactoring technology. Uh, I've spent in some capacity or another the last 10 years of my career uh, focused on improving, you know, as I like to think of it, developer happiness through improving tooling and uh, automating away the tedium of software development. Uh, so yeah, I've been very excited to to be a part of the development of this uh, technology the past two years here. Um, so agenda, so why must scale software refactoring? What problem are we solving? Um, because let's look at it in more detail so that we know what, so, what characteristics the solution needs to have. We'll introduce Open Rewrite. Uh, we'll talk about the core refactoring technology, why we are able to produce the transformations that we can produce, uh, what transformations available, uh, what can you use today, what you can assemble tomorrow, um, how we complement open rewrite with open AI. Uh, open AI became a lot a big thing last year, arrived on the scene. We experimented with it, very targeted in, in a number of ways, and uh, the results are uh, really promising, very excited about it. And then I'll pass it to Sam, who will demo all these things to you. Um, so the problem is we created way too much software and yet not enough. Uh, one of our customers, medium, large enterprise, 20 million lines of code, Java code accumulated over the decades. If you write this code in books and stack them, one after another, it's 75 million lines of code, or 75 miles of, co of code lying in the roads. Uh, so trying to transform and maintain it by hand is really just the volume, sheer volume of it is uh, impossible. But the problem is even worse because modern applications are assembled and we know that as much as 80% of composition of this application is outside of our control. It comes from open source, third party vendors, they evolve their APIs, make breaking changes, fix CVEs, issue patches, just, so it's 75 miles of code types five. However, this software assembly versus creation is actually pointed us towards a solution, a community-based solution. As dependency evolve, if they, issue refactoring solutions to their consumers, then all of us can keep up with the ecosystem and move forward together. Um, so how can you innovate when we have such a toil of migration and remediation? Um, Open Rewrite was created exactly for this purpose. It was founded uh, at Netflix by the founder of this technology, Jonathan Schneider, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here today. Uh, and it was created for exactly the same purpose. There was a problem there that they wanted to eliminate an internal library, um, replace it with SLA4J. And there were like 500 million lines of code, uh, references to it in the code. And there was a culture of freedom and responsibility. And so the central teams could never impose any constraints on the product teams. So there was no way to like have a switch by this day, you either remove this or you're broken. And the other implication of this um, freedom and responsibility was that code was inconsistent. There were hundreds of different styles how developers wanted to organize their tooling and um, styles. So the transformations, if they were 
to be created needed to be stylistically consistent with the different code bases. So eventually um, he was asking people like, what can I do to make you move forward? And he kept hearing like, if you do it for me, then I'll accept the change. And kind of this was said somewhat sarcastically because we, technology like that didn't exist and doing it by hand across the massive code bases uh, by a single developer is also not possible. Uh, and But he is a very stubborn person and he likes to, to solve problems that no one solved before. And so uh, at one of the Christmas break, uh, rewrite technology emerged and actually successfully eliminated that library. And Modern was formed around this technology in 2020 uh, we assembled a team around it and we kind of jump started the again development of this technology. And in the past two and a half, three years, it's accrued some really magical capabilities. Um, uh, like I said, uh, being able to preserve formatting of the changes is critical because um, uh, otherwise uh, the changes are not um, going to be accepted by the community. And so what's the technology under the hood? It's um, what we call a lossless semantic tree. Um, it's a very dense representation of code. Uh, leveraging the compiler, um, we produce, um, like using the compiler to resolve all of the dependencies, transitive dependencies, all of the um, type information, syntax, uh, create this tree, also go back to the code, pick up all the formatting, put it on the tree. It's a very, very dense representation uh, of code. Uh, it, we can produce code, the source text with it, without any loss of information, and we can move it forward and produce binaries. If you think both code as text and binaries are very lossy representations, like you cannot tell just by looking at the code what type some objects are, what dependency are going to be used here. Uh, and binaries, obviously, people cannot understand binaries. So this is like an intermediary. And then we have something that we called a catalog of recipes. And we constantly add recipes, more and more recipes to it, which are programs that manipulate this lossless semantic tree, effect change, and then we can write back code as text so the developer can see the transformation. Um, we Growing the catalog of recipes, there are a lot of things encapsulated already, like change method name, change type, reward the organize, like the things that happen to us all the time. And so you could leverage them very easily. But if you need to affect some very complex transformation, you could have a power programming language, Java in this case, to write a recipe that manipulates the tree and uh, transforms it in any way you want. Um, so use cases that are available to you here, as we said, migration engineering. Um, we talk to people on platform teams, uh, framework, internal framework teams, and they keep telling us all the time that um, I'm a migration engineer. As soon as one migration finishes, I need to implement another. And I try to coordinate and product teams and everything. So now you can actually automate internal change. You can contribute to a common um, third-party framework uh, migration with things like Java 8 to 17, um, Spring Boot 1 to 2 to 3, GUnit 4 to 5, um, best practices for logging, best practices from for Spring Boot. We, as, as a company, contribute a lot of to recipe development, but we also work with different vendors. We want to help them provide this automation for their consumers. And I feel like the incentives here are aligned. Uh, we all want to be on the latest versions. Vendors do not don't want to maintain old versions and consumers want to be on the latest code versions. It's just nicer. Uh, security vulnerability, we actually worked with a researcher, um, Jonathan Lightshoe, who had a, a fellowship, Dance Community Fellowship last year to remediate open source vulnerabilities. He wrote uh, control flow and data flow analysis for open rewrite and contributed a number of recipes for zip slip, um, um, 
insecure path traversal and kind of issued a bulk change request, uh, pull request campaign from our platform. Um, and we built a lot of task related issues and people really clean up their code bases from uh, uh, like any uh, things like uh, sauna cube, check style um, could be, you look at the recipe definition and we produce a, a rule definition in the third party system that some of our customers may already have and it's a acute thing that they want to fix and we pr produce a corresponding recipe that fixes this issue with automation. Like I said, we have a growing ecosystem modernization recipes, obviously started in Java, but we added a lot of infrastructure as code recipes, Terraform, Kubernetes, YAML transformations, um, uh, working with a lot of vendors, uh, open source and third party libraries. Um, Quarkus and Micronaut teams actually produced uh, refactoring migrations themselves. Uh, this time. And so we are working on Python right now and uh, TypeScript uh, and uh, C Sharp will be coming later in the year. And why we are so kind of interesting thing we discovered here that allows us to add this language is much faster than we expected is actually underneath on the AST level. Uh, a lot of languages share what academia courts calls grammar, uh, grammar islands. And so it's a C family of languages, Python, C sharp, TypeScript, Java, Groovy, Kotlin, uh, like, uh, and they kind of uh, in, inherit the same structure on a C level, even though in text, they look very different. Oh, sorry, I meant to go into presentation mode, and then I would have switched. Um, Look in the upper right corner for the slideshow button. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, you got it. And, yeah, but then it's, anyway, let me just skip to where I need to go. Uh, um, yeah, but what about code AI? As I said, we um, experimented with it. Uh, Last year, starting from, this is not for code refactoring, this is for code authorship, and then finding very interesting creative ways of inserting it us into our refactoring a a engine. Um, we on a team, all of us um, use Copilot um, as it trained with us and became more proficient in what we in particular are doing. Uh, we are safe. It saves about 30% of engineering time writing new code. But um, as we talked in the beginning, the problem that we are trying to solve here is we have not writing so much new code, but being able to fix, upgrade, migrate vast amounts of existing code. And so we need an authoritative sort of system that multi entry point system that can migrate this code. Um, forward and AI is an authorship tool, tool for code creation. As you type something in ID and the copilot makes a suggestion, the person is observing this suggestion and accepts or rejects the change. And it's a creative experience because when you write new code, there is no right or wrong way to do something because the possibilities are limited, uh, unlimited. Versus when you fix the code or upgrade a framework, there is almost like an algorithm you need to do X, Y, Z. Like we all read release notes for new version of something and mapped in your mind, I'm going to be here doing this and this and this indefinitely until, until I'm done with it and maybe I go, go on vacation afterwards too. Yeah, so it's very different problems that we are solving, but uh, I'm going to pass it to Sam to... Um, speak through and um, I cannot uh, and um, show you the different ways of integrating these two systems. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll uh, start sharing my screen whenever you're okay. 
Uh, about that. So I thought I would begin by just kind of, we've talked a bit about the power and potential of these refactoring recipes. So I thought I'd begin by just demonstrating running one across a number of repositories, uh, uh, show you kind of what the results look like, just so you have a more concrete um, idea of, yes? Just one more thing. I think we never mentioned that uh, we have a, the company behind Open the Ride, but we also have our own product, which we deploy at publicmodern.io for open source. It's free for open source, and that's the, um, the the platform that we will be doing for demoing a lot of open rewrite recipes. And uh, so it's just faster than the, with the build tools so or with CLIs. It's just all pre-compiled and pre-run. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the you know. The, the open rewrite itself is open source and on GitHub here under uh, open rewrite for any of you who want to want to check that out uh, and can be run locally as, you know, a Maven or Gradle plugin and soon by other means as well. Uh, and uh, we'll be running the recipes, the refactoring recipes from this core technology on our uh, SaaS platform. So here I have uh, just as an example of a Java refactoring recipe, one which goes and fixes a number of common static analysis issues that a scanner like SonarCube or uh, find bugs might complain at you about. Uh, and so if I just go ahead and run this, ah, it starts running on the set of repositories I've selected and pretty quickly we start getting back. Oh, Pretty quickly, we start getting back results, and we see, uh, you know, changes being made to, you know, avoid the possibility of a null pointer exception, uh, or to follow, you know, make things final that are never reassigned, uh, and you know, couldn't be overridden, um, and uh, you know, put modifiers in their canonical order, and each and every one of these changes that were made. Uh, as part of running this recipe came from a program, a recipe that some developer, possibly me or someone else on our team or someone in our open source community, uh, lovingly handcrafted to have that specific effect on your code. So there's no AI here. It is a purely rules-based system uh, where what you, you know, like any other code you write, it does exactly what you tell it to, including any mistakes you might make as a programmer. Um, so, you know, as uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT and all of these other things started to catch on and start making uh, waves in our industry and in our popular culture, we became really curious about the opportunities here for uh, for recipe authoring and for code transformation. Uh, one piece of skepticism I always had about using AI technology for this kind of stuff, which uh, is that, you know, it has to be exactly right if you want running code in the end. You know, during an interactive editing experience in your uh, in your browser, it's fine for a suggestion, or in your, uh, uh, in your IDE, it's fine for a suggestion to be a little bit inaccurate. But if you want to generate hundreds or thousands of commits, it has to be very precise. There cannot be a semicolon out of place. There cannot be a method that the AI thinks would probably exist based upon the text around it, but doesn't actually exist. Um, so, we started looking for ways to apply this technology uh, safely, where we would have more confidence in the in the correctness of the outputs to see if we could marry the systematic, analytical, rules-based, intentionally developed kind of approach that we've been taking before with you know the all the benefits of AI. Um, so I thought I would show you a comparison between a recipe that we implemented handcrafted. Uh, and one that we, uh, and that same recipe or one with very similar behavior that is AI powered. So the recipe that I will show you is a very simple one in terms of what it does. Uh, cause you know, I feel like that'd be a good starting point for experimenting with AI. So this just goes to a switch statement in Java. And if the default case is anywhere is, uh, has any, uh, other cases after it, uh, it moves the default case to the bottom where, you know, one would typically expect it to be. Uh, and so, you know, if we look at an example of the result of this recipe, we see that's what it does. It takes the default case and in this case, another couple labels that accrued to it and, uh, you know, moves those to the bottom. 
as you would uh, as you would typically expect. So the code that implements this recipe that I just ran right now looks like this. This is the actual implementation of the default comes last visitor that you can go look up in that open rear repository I showed you. And there's various logic to visit a switch statement and to iterate through the cases and try to tell if the default case is already last and, you know, make make transformations like the ones I affected, uh, you know, I, when I showed you in the web interface. And here's examples of some automated tests with the, you know, the text before the recipe runs and the text as it's supposed to be after the recipe runs, you know, in this case, moving the default statement from here to here. Uh, and, you know, this program is, it's it's moderately complicated. It clocks in at just under 200 lines. It would surely take an experienced programmer a little bit of time to read and understand this and to, you know, find and fix bugs or what have you. Uh, and it took someone who was already ramped up on the framework at least a few hours to write this. Now, so we chose this as a candidate to try writing with AI and the implementation of the AI version of that, of the same recipe looks like, uh, looks like this. You visit the switch statement <clears throat> and then you just ask the AI editor, Hey, would you please rewrite this switch statement? With the default case coming last, and if we look at the 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 test for this, you know we see just like the test for the handcrafted version, you know we have a case where the default label is not last, and we're expecting it to be moved to the last. So let's go ahead and run this test and see what kind of uh, see what kind of results we get from it. Is you know a uh, uh, the hand authored rule based approach is going to be very deterministic in the results it provides. But AI is a little bit fuzzy. It's a little bit lossy, a little bit unpredictable. So you see here, we're running this test in a loop. And some fraction of those give us exactly what we want. We get the expected output value from applying the recipe to it. Uh, and in some of them, we get output values that are slightly wrong, right? Like in this case, it just didn't move anything. Yeah, we expected it to. Uh, put the default case last, but it actually put case zero last. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's not the only way that it can necessarily be confused. You know, in this case, uh, well, you know, we're calling out to a remote service, you know, open AI, and we hit a hit a rate limit. So, you know, in the future, the, kind of our plans for how to integrate this AI stuff in a sustained way tend to involve a model that could actually be present locally that wouldn't depend on any external service uh, that could you know, rate limit you or be inaccessible or just down due to uh, in network problems or what have you. Um, so, which leads into uh, kind of a core facet of using AI for software development or for this kind of change. One, it, it can do some unpredictable things. Uh, and so if you can use something more structured to constrain it to like just change this thing, well, now, like only change switch statements, it doesn't have an opportunity to make any incorrect changes to other parts of the code. And it is often much, much easier to write code that verifies that something has the value that you expect it to have than it would be to write code that affects the transformation to get it there, right? It's easier to check that a math, you know, mathematical equations result is correct than it is to, you know, solve the system of equations to, to get that result in the first place. And that's very much kind of, we found that to be very true when dealing with AI. Um, yeah, so in this case, you know, any engineer working with AI for code generation type tasks is going to quickly start becoming something of a query tuning engineer in terms of you ask, you give the AI model a, a question or a command and you get back some result that isn't quite what you want and you refine and refine something all of us have been used to doing, although it isn't, you know, or at least wasn't an AI driven system with, you know, Google queries since, uh, since the ancient times when we searched the web on stone tablets. Uh, so, you know, I might amend this query to, uh, uh, to the, the model to say, yeah, yeah, do not alter any other do not alter any other cases. And yeah, last time when we ran it, well, let's see how many of these were. Hopefully I gave it enough time for the rate limit not to be mad at me. <laughs> yeah, there were a couple that failed from rate limiting. 
We'll see. We'll see how this run does. If it is, uh, if this alteration to the query leads to a, a higher success rate. Oh, that's interesting. Here's a result I haven't seen before. <laughs> it added a comment telling me that this break is not necessary. <laughs> so maybe we could try. <laughs> do not add any. <laughs> do not add any editorializing comments about what you whether or not you think it's necessary to have break statements there. Yeah, there was a rate limit, but you can see even with just adding the you know, do not alter the other cases, uh, we you know increased our success rate except for the the rate limiting one. So yeah, let's go try this query again and 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 see how that how that affects things. Oh, and by the way, this rewrite generative AI project is yeah hitting some rate limits, so that's that's messing up, but. Well, that's how that's how demos go sometimes. Um, oh yeah, and by the way, this whole project here is uh, this is also open source. So if you want to uh, take a look at rewrite generative AI and play around with this yourself, try to write some generative recipes of your own. Uh, you know, here is the project you can go to to try it out. Uh, the only thing you'll have to do, since this does rely on an external service we do not control in the form of OpenAI, is you'll have to put a uh, token.txt file in the resources uh, folder with your personal access token. Um, but you can all, you know, if you have any, want to experiment with that and have any questions or problems with the process, you can join our open source community Slack that we'll provide a, a link to at the end of this presentation. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm happy to answer your questions or chat with you about any of these subjects. So uh, before I kind of move on to other uh, ways that AI can be applicable to um, software development and automated remediation of code problems, uh, I thought I would pause and ask if anyone had questions or comments about uh, what I've shown you so far. I have a comment. Oh, please do. <laughs> Yeah, so as you could see, we are pretty much trading the accuracy of recipe results for the time it takes to develop a recipe. And so where it's it's going to be viable is when you do a one-off framework migration, so something that anyway requires a lot of detailed code review. And, and so we feel like it really will accelerate like these one off migrations that um, it, uh, really like versus like the recipes that are core catalog of like change type and things like that, that and maybe even the SAS recipes that uh, we have. Yeah, we very much see these, the approach of uh, the deliberately engineered <laughs> uh, code complementing and correcting for the errors of the uh, the generated or the, the AI based approaches. Um, all right. Well, if anyone decides they have a, a question or comment, uh, feel free to interject later. Uh, so I thought I would also show you. So you know that is the kind of uh, a demonstration of the applicability of AI to code transformation and update. And I thought I would show you uh, a way that it can be applicable to the interpretation or analysis of issues with code because these same kind of uh, refactoring recipes that I've been talking about so far, you can also use them to uh, query information about your code and produce data tables or reports about uh, any of the information you found here. So one <clears throat> kind of search or problem that we have uh, in trying to create uh, parsers that can parse every kind of source file uh, in every language in the world, or at least every major programming language in the world is that like any other software, our software sometimes has bugs or runs into real world complications. And so we, you know, out of thousands of projects that we might try to want to parse and run recipes on, we'll fail on some percentage of those. And you could be hit with an absolutely overwhelming number of different errors, you know, different ways, failure modes, and have a, a potentially a mountain of data to sort through. Uh, to try and figure out what the most pressing issue is, what the most 
where you're going to get the most return on investment for spending your time fixing a bug. Obviously, if you fix a bug that affects a thousand repositories, that's a better use of your time than an equivalently difficult to fix bug that affects one repository. Uh, so, you know, we have this data table concept uh, and, you know, you can download the, um, the report here uh, and view it and process it in Excel or other spreadsheet type applications. I'll just let that, yeah, there we go. Oh my, it looks like, I'll rerun this recipe. It looks like the results, I had run this before. Uh, I'd run this before, but I guess the results are no longer available. So let's see, maybe I have a more recent run of that. How about this one? Is the data still available for this one? Uh, no data available for that one either. Okay. Well, let's see. Okay, so we'll we'll run it fresh to be sure we have the most up to date information and try one more time to look at the data table. Okay, here you go. So you know, this is the report produced by this recipe about all the you know repositories where there was you know at least one file that we had some manner of trouble parsing. Uh, and, you know, if you can see over here, we record the stack trace uh, from it, which, you know, can end up being, or at least the first line of the stack trace. Uh, and, you know, for a small data set like this, these few dozen, you know, it's pretty obvious just from looking that, you know, this is a pretty prominent sort of exception. But as you get into hundreds or thousands of rows, it becomes less amenable to just glancing at it type analysis. <laughs> Uh, and you can start to want to group like failures together so that you can count things that are similar. Uh, so let's take a look at a Jupyter notebook we have made that processes that data I've just shown you with the help of AI into a more useful form. So, you know, we have this embedded in the browser in here and you can, uh, and this lets you process data tables right in the browser and come up with custom visualizations. So, you know, you can see it loading that Excel spreadsheet uh, and start uh, importing OpenAI. And the first OpenAI model that it uses here is uh, the embedding model. And this is pretty interesting uh, in terms of what it does and why you would want to use it. So we have a bunch of stack traces and many of them are going to be very similar except for some particulars, right? It'll be the same error message, except the file path is different because it's a, the same problem, but on a different file in a different repository. So you would want those error messages to be recognized, to be similar and grouped together uh, by some, some heuristic. And that's what, exactly what this embeddings model does. It takes in text and it maps them to some multi-dimensional vector space based upon the particulars of how this model was trained uh, that ends up with like um, like strings of text by whatever heuristic this model has derived internally grouped together as a sequence of numbers. Uh, and so once we have turned, you know, once we've turned text into numbers representing how similar, uh, <clears throat> or they can be used to represent how similar the, the blocks of text are to each other's. Well, then we can use numerical analysis like k-means clustering to group, you know, to, to identify like groups. And so this is again, another example of uh, interleaving analytical deterministic methods like k-means clustering, probably familiar to many of you who took computer science and statistics classes. Uh, there's no AI there. It's a well-known algorithm that has existed for a long time, but you can't, apply it to text. And the usage of AI to turn text into embeddings 
now made this numerical method much easier to access than it would have been otherwise. Uh, so yeah, you run the run the clustering, and you finally you know plot it all as a um, uh, <clears throat> you finally plot it all. Well, collapse it down into two dimensions, plot it all, and you you know in this case get these sets of clusters uh, where we now would have the beginnings of some kind of report, something you could take action on. You can kind of see, well, there's about, you know, several several kind of distinct problems here. And, you know, the one where there are the most instances of a particular problem is probably a good place to start your efforts. Um, but you still may want to have some information. Why are these things clustered together? Uh, you know, what is the commonality here? And that's where AI can again kind of step in to give us a little bit of an assist. Uh, so here we use uh, again another open AI model called completion. And we query, uh, we ask it to tell us for each given group that the that K means has clustered together for us, what are the following errors have in common? Now, this will be the AI's interpretation of the commonality of these errors. So, you know, this is this is what it thinks. The theme of each uh, each group is, you know, in this case, you know, all the errors are caused by type mismatch. We expect to type an actual type, you know, that's that's about right. With the class cast exception, it's not super insightful necessarily, but that could say something about how useful our error message is, as well as about you know the nature of the model. And kind of similarly, it has you know identified that you know there's a problem inside of the Java C compiler uh, in here, and and so on and so forth for each of the um, each of the other groups with themes of greater or lesser use uh, or greater or lesser kind of accuracy. So you know, in terms of asking it to produce something human readable, um, it's nice to it's nice to have a starting point. Uh, but you would probably before you you know sent off this report to management or started making prioritization decisions based on it want to do some of your own analysis and decide how uh, and, and investigate the accuracy of these themes and uh, investigate those clusters. Uh, but yeah, so kind of together, the analytical algorithmic deterministic systems and the AI systems can work hand in hand to enhance each other's ease of use and capability. So that's you know what I find to be great about AI very easy to interact with. You talk to it in natural language. Downside is you get noisier, inaccurate, or results that are, you know, the guesses of a model, you know, whereas an analytical uh, design developed approach to code you hand create, it deterministically does exactly what you tell it to do. Uh, and doing that correctly and exhaustively can take a great deal of time and effort on your part uh, and a lot of testing. Uh, and but you can use these things to kind of uh, address the other's weaknesses. You know, use AI where it makes sense. Use analytical methods to cover for its weaknesses, and vice versa. Uh, yeah, so that's that's basically all that I have to to demo. Maybe I guess that just leaves uh, kind of uh, kind of what I'm saying about how yeah the themes I was just expounding upon. Uh, yeah, are there any questions about that or anything I've said so far? I have a question here. Yes, please. Um, so earlier, based on your earlier demo, um, mm -hmm. so many static code analysis tools allow custom rules to be added. Mm -hmm. And uh, can um, recipes be returned to uh, modify the code based on um, those custom rules? Yeah, you can make a recipe to do... Almost any code, I mean, you can make a recipe to affect any code transformation you want. Uh, so if you have a particular, you know, so in our case, our like common static analysis recipe, let me just pull that, pull that up again. So our common static analysis issues recipe is made up of all of these individual recipes. So, you know, it's a, it's a listing. It, uh, it applies each of these things. Now, for your organization, you might have a different list, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, 
maybe you don't, maybe your organization doesn't care about one of these criteria or has some custom criteria of its own, you can easily, uh, let's see. Ah, this is what I want. I want to add selected to builder. Yeah. So, you know, we have a kind of a, a YAML format for creating a recipe like this where you could easily, you know, add or remove entries from the list. And, you know, if you have some custom rule or something you want done that we haven't implemented yet, uh, well, you know, we you can uh, implement a recipe either analytically uh, as I've just, uh, by hand or with AI uh, or both or some combination of both to address that need. So, you know, for each of these guys, you can like go and there we're all open source. So, you know, you can go look in our code base, go find this implementation for final class, you know, which is just one I sort of picked at random from this list and, you know, go, go check out its implementation. Go check out its test to kind of see what it does and maybe implement a similar recipe for your organization's static analysis yeah. uh, problem. So you could click on our spec. It actually takes you to SonaCube definition of the rule uh, as we implement it. Um, we're just really adding more and more of these as we work with our customers and they have priorities that they want to fix and specific things that they um, ask us to prioritize. Um, and we just, we look at the compliant, non-compliant code and we create craft a recipe that addresses it. A lot of people we work with, internal teams, platform teams, will start building recipes very quickly. There is like declarative, like YAML, but for things like common things like change method name, there will be a recipe that does this. So a lot of recipes can be very quickly assembled out of existing building blocks. And then there is very interesting custom recipes that people are building. For example, uh, one person wrote a recipe to integrate with Launch Darkly to look for unused feature flags, go back to code, rip up the code out of the code basis, and then go back to Launch Darkly, remove the feature flag, and then like continuously clean after the feature flags. And so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Mm -hmm. Uh, very nice presentation and idea, by the way. Now, let's see. It looks like I've got a couple questions in the chat. Like, do you do dog fooding? I run the open rewrite against the open rewrite code base. Yes, we do, uh, and we find it to certainly be convenient way to address our own static analysis shortcomings. Um, some interesting, interesting results of this. One interesting result is that we need to augment our Java compiler to support annotation processors better, or our Java parser to support annotation processors better, because we really like Lombok, uh, but right now our Java parser doesn't support it. Uh, but even with some type information missing about Lombok generated methods, I still find it to be a convenient way to uh, do static analysis fixes. Uh, to have consistent formatting, apply license headers, uh, you know, a lot of these things. We, for our repository specifically, you know, that we, you know, that we maintain an open rewrite, we want to make these very easy libraries for people to use, which means keeping dependencies to a minimum. So, like, at least on the open rewrite side, we don't have a lot, we don't have all of the software supply chain management challenges uh, that other projects have, but we do have some of them, such as, uh, caring about uh, dependency, having known vulnerabilities, right? We want people to be able to use the library safely. So, you know, we go check out, uh, you know, use the OWASP database to scan the dependencies we do have uh, for vulnerabilities and, uh, you know, use our own tool to update dependency versions accordingly. Uh, yeah. Let's see, got asked about, hopefully that answers your question, Ihor. Uh, yeah. yeah. We use it both for open rewrite and modern code based and they're different. One is open source tool, the other microservices based development. So different. And the other thing we just recently, I think added a lot of enough Gradle capabilities to allow us to upgrade our own Gradle dependencies uh, uh, all the time. We are like SOC2 so, so type 2 compliant and every week we have to upgrade everything and make sure we close vulnerabilities so we finally were able to start using uh, recipes for that. 
Yeah, let's see. Uh, log for shell. Re- yeah, yeah, but log for shell. Let's see, I don't know if I have that one pulled up. Yeah, let me get let me get back to you on the uh, I, on the log for J fix. I don't have that recipe in front of me at the moment. Yeah, we can at least show the in maybe any dependency management dependency insight recipe for finding usages of some third party library. Yeah, sure. So like on the subject of dependency vulnerabilities, this is you know, here's one we've created recently that is uh, you know pretty useful. Uh, this like check for dependency vulnerabilities recipe, you know, it goes and uses the, the the OWSP database, and you can use it to, uh, and it will attempt to both. It'll both like produce a report about all of the vulnerability, you know, a data table like we showed you uh, earlier about all of the uh, the the vulnerabilities it finds, as well as uh, attempt to update minor or patch version numbers in pom.xmls and soon also build that Gradle files uh, with new versions when that is available, right? Not every fix has a new version. Oh, I mm-hmm. thought I said not to run with. Yeah, I had earlier the same issue where it's... Yeah, I said use markers false. Hmm. And for some reason, it keeps markers on. Huh, maybe there's a little bug in the recipe there. Yeah, I didn't intend for there to be... Uh, so yeah, it's just an option of this recipe that it can. So the search markers, we find we think about search as an instance of transformation instead of rather than transforming the code, we mark the code. In this case, it identified places in the code where a vulnerable dependency was brought in. Uh, I bet I see these are these are Gradle uh, Gradle Groovy projects mm. where I, I bet that. You know, we're, we're just now been adding that to this. This is a recipe actively under development. And I bet that uh, that setting for, hey, don't add the search results hasn't been uh, propagated through to those. If you go look at, uh, I don't know, a Maven project, if you go look at Spring, no, nope, nope. Oh, yeah, that Spring Pet Clinic has both because it's a demo project. Uh, let's see, go look at, I don't know, a Spring Cloud Schema Registry look. Taking a minute to render the diff. There we go. Yeah, and you see, I I set it to you know override depend you know vulnerable dependency version. So you know previously, yeah. So you know previously these may have been coming from a parent pom, um, but yeah, this can both make a kind of best at, uh, an attempt to upgrade the dependency version to some, one that is known not to be vulnerable, uh, and you know, it all also produces, you know, like I showed you for that other recipe, uh, a data table uh, where you could get a full, you know, a report out of it on everything that it identified as vulnerable, what the vulnerability was. Let's see. That's, oh, right, I need to select the columns like this. Not as much of an Excel tracker. Yeah. So you see here, you know, we can get a report of, you know, exactly which CVEs that identified in which repositories, what the artifact ID was that had the that had the, the vulnerability, uh, a summary of the issue, and if one is known, a version where that, that vulnerability is fixed. So like this is the, the fixed version info is kind of what we're going off of, uh, along with having you know a rich model of the project's dependencies to even know what versions it resolves of things. And when a fix for something is a minor or patch, well, we just have the recipe go ahead and suggest a um, you know a change. And so, you know, if we wanted to from any of these um you know, we could go and open a pull request to that repository to uh to try to bump that dependency version you know, from this interface, or they could go and run the recipe locally through one of our build plugins and and make the change that way. Yeah, so it uses GitHub uh, data of vulnerabilities that GitHub made public and uses it as a database. Yeah, the OWASP uh, database, they're turning off their RSS feed 
uh, and turning off direct downloads of the database and some of the popular build plugins for Maven and Gradle that previously used that database um, uh, will cease to function as some of them are not planning to update. So if any of you in your builds happen to use a plugin that relies on that the availability of that OWASP database, you know, just be warned it's availability. Uh, it may may get uh, may start to be a bit stale soon. Well, yeah, let's see. So any other any other questions about anything I've uh, kind of shown you so far? Now, I def I see automation as being essential to, to to managing all of the the tedium of the software development process, right? We're professional automators, but we have all these manual changes of up, bump this version to that version, replace this deprecated method with its replacement. Our YAML configuration file used to have this format, but now it has this format. And we've, uh, I've personally, and I'm sure many of you have spent a lot of time uh, in your career just working on that kind of tedious thing. And uh, I think we can make that a thing of the past move the state of the art forward to a place where we can spend more of our time focusing on actually challenging and interesting problems and delivering real business value rather than just struggling to stay afloat in a in a in a tide of uh of vulnerability reports uh and breaking changes throughout our software supply chain. So that's uh that's all I have. Oh, I guess one final thing I, should, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, point out uh, is just that you know you can find out more about our technology and find our code on our documentation website. You know for Open Rewrite, that's hosted on GitHub. Uh, you can check out our documentation. Uh, I encourage if any of you have questions about any of this or want to try developing a recipe yourself, you know you can join our open source community Slack, open to all. Feel free to wave at me when you get there, and I'm happy to answer any questions, help you write your first recipe, whether it is an AI-based uh, one or uh, something more deliberately, you know, a handcrafted one, let's say. Uh, so, yeah, that's all the content I have for you. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Olga? Uh, I have a very last question. Sure. I decided to unmute and just yeah, ask. Yeah, go for it. So I guess the answer is no, but I'll still ask. Like, what do you guys think about non-statically typed languages like Python or pure JavaScript? We're is it even possible to do something meaningful? Sure. Sam, yeah. uh, Sam, before you answer, would you mind putting the follow-up slide back up so that people oh, yeah. can see those? Uh, You're right. Those that, that, that would be smarter to just leave that up. Thank you, Peter. No, it's all good. All good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you asked about non-statically typed languages. Yes, absolutely. We're implementing support for Python right now and well and TypeScript very soon. And unlike Java, you know, both of those languages have uh, dynamic types or allow types not to be specified in many circumstances. Uh, and so the answer you, there's a lot you can still do, right? It, you know, when you have the type information, like, you know, someone brought up the subject of like, uh, like log4j versus slf4j earlier. When you have all the type information, you can tell the difference between a log.info call that's addressing log4j and one that's going to slf4j, uh, you know, in a way that a purely text-based system can't. Um, so with the language that where all of that type information may or may not be present and even frequently won't be present, um, you may not have, you can still make changes and you can still make transformations and you can still do updates, but there may be circumstances where a recipe could not programmatically be sure what the type of something is and might err on the side of caution and not make a change. Uh, I think that will be a balance for us to navigate as we try to provide a useful body of recipes for TypeScript and Python, uh, how we handle cases where type annotations are not available. And this is a case where, again, AI could uh, potentially be leveraged to help somewhat, because I could absolutely imagine that uh, an early recipe we might write that a lot of people might find really useful uh, for something, uh, a language like Python or TypeScript is a, uh, is an annotate everything with its probable type annotation uh, recipe that could go through and follow. We have some data flow analysis and tape tracking capabilities for Java already. Uh, and if we implement that stuff for Python uh, and TypeScript as well, as we surely intend to, or as we as we do intend to, um, 
you could use a combination of having the full abstract syntax tree, having uh, some data flow analysis, having information about the complete matrix of dependencies to make, I think, some, and you know, maybe a little bit of, of AI uh, in there as well, to make some pretty well-educated you know, guesses about what type uh, annotations there should be for a, a Python or TypeScript program. Uh, so, you know, your to, you know, your original question was about how applicable this is to uh, dynamically typed languages, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely more difficult to make changes that require type information with high confidence. Uh, but there's a lot you can do just structurally, and there uh, and some of the techniques I've outlined there. I think it'll be uh, lower the barrier to moving those uh, code bases towards being more statically typed, you know, should the users of those repositories want that for their repository. Uh, does that answer your question pretty well? Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much, Olga. Cool, yeah, thanks. And does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, and Sam, I should just let you know that I just saw uh, Jonathan uh, join uh, a minute yeah. or two ago. So. Yeah, howdy, Jonathan. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, so folks, uh, if you haven't figured it out already, you're, you can unmute yourselves. So please feel free to, to jump in and ask questions. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, Sam, thanks for leaving the follow-up screen up. This is great. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I, I did have to step out for one second. Sam, did you cover, um, what, did you already cover like IDE tool integration? Uh, is that something... I, uh, we have not discussed that. It is a uh, it's it's something on our on our roadmap to provide more integrations with other tools uh, as as uh, as time goes on to make uh, you know refactoring recipes and search recipes and all of these analysis capabilities more directly at your fingertips. Uh, yeah, and I know that uh, some people uh, like the some guys on uh, at VMware uh, who work on Spring uh, who are already uh, integrating open rewrite into and its refactoring recipes into uh, Eclipse and IntelliJ and a plugin they're working on. Uh, I can't be very specific about what our you know, plans for that are because it's not incredibly well defined at this point. But just yes, a general question. Yeah, I, I wasn't trying to paint you into a corner. I, I was just I was just curious because it no, didn't seem yeah. like an the answer obvious is, integration yeah, point. Is, no, not right now, but yes, eventually. Yeah, right cool. now the easiest way for a, a, a developer working locally to run a refactoring recipe uh, is through one of our build plugins for uh, for Maven or Gradle. Yeah. Yeah, we had a build plugin at some point for fine usages of API and modern whenever. Uh, yeah, an like IntelliJ you, plugin. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, we, build, build plugins seem like the obvious first point of integration, so that that's why I was. That's, yeah, that's yeah. kind of where yeah, it's kind of where you have to start because we need if we want information about what the transitive dependencies are and what types totally. are going on the class path, the build system is what know, is what knows that. So yeah, that's where yep. you start. Uh, yep. And yeah, we've we've prototyped IDE plugins before, uh, and you know found them to be useful, and and absolutely plan to do more with that in the future. Just curious. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Thanks, Peter. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Jonathan knows someone that knows someone on the on the Spring Tool Suite team. Team. Wink, wink. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> speaking of Eclipse and, and VMware. Uh, cool. Anyone else have uh, any other questions? Um, and in case you you missed it or you joined late, um, I will one last time drop the uh, YouTube URL here. Um, just give us a, a day or two um, in Logic 2020. Our Zoom sponsor will um, you know have that uploaded to the channel. Uh, so um, unfortunately, uh, as a volunteer organization, we're a little short staffed. So um, you know, in a perfect world, I would send you a, an email through the Meetup.com system. Um, but, um, you know, we're really trying to, to get all of our um, replays up on the YouTube channel. So uh, and, you know, most folks have a, a, a Gmail and, and have been on YouTube before. So um, that's a, a fairly easy one. So, yeah, just go there, click the subscribe and the little, little alert bell, uh, and then you'll get a notification when it's published. Um, and Sam, I will um, I'm, I'm trying furiously to type these down, uh, you know, write these down real quick while we're on the slide so that uh um, Wait, I tell you I what, I'll do that. I'll do that while you address any, anything else you want to talk about. Cool. Uh, anyone else have questions? 
Cool. We still have a number of folks on the line. Um, so way to go. Yeah, hardly, you know, uh, hardly anyone's uh, dropped off. Um, thanks for that, Sam. Appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that any this those links and any other follow up links, um, uh, you know, that you would like me to have will be in the YouTube video description uh, on the on the channel. Great. Uh, and yeah, please come back uh, next month. Um, we're going to be uh, on, on March 15th. Uh, we're going to be at the um, uh, Microsoft Reactor San Francisco. Um, and uh, yeah, um, that's going to be a hybrid event. So you can join via Zoom or you can also go to the Microsoft San Francisco um, uh, hi, uh, Microsoft Reactor uh, space and we'll do a hybrid event. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that'll that'll be really fun. That'll be uh, talking about Kubernetes and performance scaling um, from uh, Bellsoft, who's an open JDK committer. Uh, and then, as always, um, really would love to hear from you uh, what kinds of topics you'd like to see. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me via the Meetup site or, or what have you. Uh, say something in the Slack chat. You know, send me a carrier pigeon, whatever. Uh, you know, let us know um, uh, what kinds of, of topics you'd like to see in the future. And Olga, Sam would really love to have you back. I think this is a, a great, great topic, um, and just one that not a lot of people are talking about in this way. Um, you know, the, you, I think Modern is fairly unique um, and, uh, you know, are, is attacking the problem in a, in a really interesting way. And I think, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of value here um, for managing technical debt, among other things. Um, so super cool stuff. Um, and would love to have you back as you, you know, hit major milestones with the product uh, and want to come back and talk about it again. So um, very much would would welcome you, would welcome you and your colleagues back. It would be our pleasure to do so. Cool. All right, folks. Um, with that, uh, if there one last call for questions, and then I think maybe it's probably time to say uh, say thanks and, and have a great night and be safe. Um, and Olga, I you know I know uh, you and I never overlapped at, at VMware, but it's it's very nice to meet you. I heard I heard a lot about you. Um, so it's it's very nice to meet you, even if even if virtually. Uh, and I don't think we overlapped much, but uh, um, pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, great to meet you too, and thank yeah, you for inviting no. us here. No problem. Okay, cool. All right, folks. Uh, we'll be well. Have a great night, and um, we'll see you hopefully next month. Uh, you're welcome, Jay. Uh, have a great night, and John. Great to see you. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank you.